association or if you're from a um, university, what um, your um, what your association is with um, Nice Tea Sol, that would be great. I'm Karen Gregory. I'm from Clarkson University. I am and the director of the Tea Sol program there. I'm an assistant professor, and um, we hosted a webinar just like this um, a few weeks ago. I actually don't even remember when that was because time has kind of gotten wacky. <laughs> But um, it was at the beginning of all this. And um, at that time, we were just trying to figure out what is everybody doing and what's the best way to approach um, teaching our English learners in online environments and from a distance and in this virtual environment. So we thought it would be a good idea to come back to revisit this topic and see at the sort of towards the end of it all now, how this has all worked out and what people have done that's worked well, what lessons we've learned, and what we can take away from all of this as we move forward into um, the next school year. So I'm gonna pass it on to Gretchen Oliver at this point, and she's gonna introduce some of the um, leadership team that we have with us here today. Hi everyone, um, as Karen said, um, we thought it would be a good idea to um, have a, a touch point and come together before we um, break for the summer. And um, we, together as a leadership team, myself, Karen, Mary, Jen, Laura, and Jody, um, just thought we would do something super informal. Um, and we're gonna invite each of them to share a little bit. Um, Karen and I will share some of our lessons learned from the higher ed perspective. And then um, we will open it up for questions and comments. Um, if you have questions and comments that you'd like to add as people are going along, feel free to put them in the chat and I will um, sort through them and we'll bring them up at the end. Um, so let's get started with um, Mary Sandoval from Gilderland, um, where she teaches ENL and she is the ENL teacher leader there. Mary, take it away. Hi everyone, thank you Gretchen. Um, I'm really excited to be here and also excited to hear from all of you as to how this season of remote learning and teaching has been going. Um, as Gretchen said, I work for Gilderland Central School District. I am the uh, K-1 ENL teacher in one of the elementary schools. I also work with ELLs um, in grades second through fifth grade for one-on-one -on -one reading intervention support. And I am the K-12 through ENL teacher leader of the district. Um, so I, I did ask my colleagues to help, um, help me represent our voice at Gilderland. And after looking at their comments from the Google form that I had put together for our team, a lot of the common strands of, you know, quote unquote lessons learned during this time would be the first one um, that I noticed was to stay and be flexible. I think um, a lot of these principles that we'll be sharing will be uh, applicable to whether we are in person with our students. Uh, face base or through continuing remote teaching. Um, I think that's been one of the key things for our team at Gilderland is to continue to reflect and be responsive and be uh, flexible with ourselves and our students um, because we can we either district guidelines have shifted a little bit or student engagement has shifted a little bit or the need to tailor the instruction has changed throughout the course of remote learning. So. I think the, the lesson of being flexible in all circumstances and in our collaborative relationships has been really important. I think the other big takeaway that our team has shared is that um, consistency and taking small steps in translating our face-to-face -face instruction to online learning is really important. Um, I think especially with our youngest learners, We've had to make um, our instruction even more explicit, provide more opportunities for modeling, um, both in our, our oral and verbal directions, but then with the materials and the resources we use to support their learning. Um, the one-on-one -on -one sessions and small group instruction that we've been able to provide have been the platform the platforms and opportunities to reach students um, at a more differentiated level. And, we've, and we definitely balance that with whole group meetings, classroom meetings, um, so that a sense of community was still held for all students, both L's and non-L's. Um, I think another piece that was really important was just 
how um, important it is to set up consistent routines and structures for your students and for yourself. I think when students can anticipate what the learning will look like or what a class meeting will um, look like, then they're better able to attend the new learning that's in front of them and also have familiarity with, you know, the, um, the structure and of your meeting and therefore can start to learn some of these new digital skills that they have to now take on um, through remote learning. So just to reiterate, I would say uh, flexibility, responsiveness, and then taking those small steps to ask yourselves, what were we doing um, with face-to-face -face learning that can now be translated into online learning for our students? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, we appreciate the, the uh, insights and the um, lessons learned that you, you've been able to share with us. Um, we're gonna transition over to Laura Eggleston from Mohanneson. So Laura, if you'd like to take it away. Great, thank you, Gretchen. And thank you, Mary, for all of those insights. I share many of the insights that you described, especially the flexibility piece. And um, in addition to that, really, thinking about our relationships, just the importance of our relationships with our students' families. And I've just found that that is such a critical piece, being able to reach out to them, you know, having, you know, I feel so fortunate to have developed the relationships prior to the closures. You know, I really felt that the, you know, the families, they trusted me so I could reach out to them and you help them through some of the technology because it's been a challenge. It's definitely been a challenge. Kindergarten, first and second grade, in terms of having a Google Meet with my kindergartners, <laughs> you know, it's a lesson learned is that I cannot have an instructional meet, an effective instructional meet with more than two kindergartners. That's a lesson learned. Um, definitely, as Mary said, you know, trying to do more one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, Still incorporating the whole group so that we have the, the class Google Meet, you know, so that we can all see each other. Those have been, it, during this time, those meets have been more for, for social reasons, which is very important too. And I think that that's another lesson learned is, you know, teaching with compassion and care for our families and really considering what they're going through and really taking the time to reach out to them and have those conversations in terms of how can we support you? How can we support, you know, your student and you as a family? And, you know, letting them know that, you know, we're here. We're here as their teachers. And of course, academics are very important to us. You know, we, we want to continue, as Mary said, we want to continue and make sure that our students are, are well prepared for next year. That's That's something that we've been discussing a lot in terms of how we can help our students that maybe have not been able to participate with the digital learning, you know, thinking outside of the box in terms of the asynchronous and synchronous learning, um, how to incorporate both types of learning for our students. And I also think a really important lesson that I've learned is just being re ready to pivot my instruction. And I've learned an awful lot from Jen, who is also on this meet today, in terms of, and Mary mentioned this as well, how I can bring what I would be teaching in a classroom to my students digitally, and how I can work with my co-teachers to effectively co-teach remotely together and plan and everything that we were doing together in the brick and mortar setting. How can we do that remotely? And just being prepared to know that, you know, we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the fall will bring but also just thinking about that if we were to go back, which I hope that we do to our school, that we, to be prepared in, in the, you know, with, for the possibility of having to, to go back to virtual instruction. Just really, you know, familiarizing myself with all of the tools that are really at my disposal to help facilitate my instruction. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, 
you bring up the co-teaching it's not just you know getting through our content but the the idea that we we you know we have these relationships with our co-teachers and so that's an area of focus it's not just our students but there's students and their families and we want to keep those relationships and it all starts with relationships so um, i'm so glad that you and jen already had a chance to be able to talk about this together so we're going to transfer over to jen from north colony and let her share her perspective so take it away jen Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Jen Samanak and I teach ENL in North Colony and I'm also the ENL instructional coach. Um, this has been quite a learning curve for me. Uh, before this, I did not really have much uh, background knowledge in the way of instructional technology. So there was a lot of learning to be done. But what I found really worked was keeping an open line of communication with my co-teachers. And so we discussed all the lesson planning and we had a shared document that we utilized in order to do our co-planning. Oh, I'm sorry, I see ENL. ENL, uh, English is a new language. So I'm the English is one of the English as a new language teachers in North Colony. So anyway, having a good uh, line of communication for our, um, between myself and our co-teachers really functioned very well because um, we had to really align a lot of our instruction and we did a division of labor, which we found to be very beneficial for our students. So I took on one area of instruction and targeted that area of instruction and provided all of the scaffolds. And this enabled my co-teachers who were very knowledgeable in um, ENL instruction as well, to uh, modify their lessons and provide their scaffolds. Because creating an asynchronous uh, lesson requires a tremendous amount of labor, as I'm sure you all know. And so having that division of labor with my co-teachers really allowed us to create lessons that were properly scaffolded for all the children in the classroom. What didn't work, <laughs> we're attempting to try new methods of response. Um, I focus on lower elementary and having a different method of response than they had tried in the past proved very problematic. So moving forward and looking forward into the fall, when hopefully we return to a brick and mortar setting in September, just like how you do, um, you help children learn the structures and the routines in September, and perhaps you use a structure like Daily Five, definitely incorporating into that technology into the structures and routines so that they learn immediately how to log in and they learn how to navigate through that platform is critical. Right off the bat, that's one of the first things we need to focus on. Also, I think moving forward, really having um, parents be involved in their online instruction and having a parent information night, just like an open house, except in addition to open house, having families log in, having families learn how to navigate the instructional platform that your district has chosen, I think is going to also be critical in moving forward. Uh, our districts up here really actively provided the technology to families. But if the families didn't know how to utilize that technology, you might as well have handed them a brick. So we really need to think more globally about our instruction with technology and include families in that. In our district, we are moving toward launching a parent resource website. And on that resource website, we'll include instructions for how to utilize Google Classroom in multiple languages for our families. I also think it's going to be very important, even more so as we probably will continue to utilize remote instruction that we look at having a consistency of platform and a consistency of instructional topics that are taught across grade levels and then if your district has multiple buildings in the elementary level. I think having more consistency is going to be a critical component moving forward. Not that we all need to be uh, teaching from a script, which I am vehemently opposed to, but that we're teaching the same topics and themes so that it'll make it easier for the ENL teacher to uh, scaffold lessons that can be utilized across uh, buildings and within a single grade level. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, that the idea of consistency is just so important. Um, you know, Good. how are you? We want our families to have to learn so many different platforms. No, I'm here. Yes, yes, I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry. And so many different. Um, ways of, of engaging with uh, with um, the content that we're presenting to them. So that consistency is so very important. 
Um, we're going to turn it over to Jody um, from uh, Albany, who is the ENL intake coordinator there. And Jody's got some ideas to share from her colleagues from um, pre K right on up through 12, and included um, with the newcomers uh, program at Al Albany International Center. So, Jody, take it away. Hi, thanks, Gretchen. Um, as Gretchen said, I'm the ENL intake coordinator. So, pre closure, my responsibilities were really in terms of helping our families register, making sure the nice hotel was done with fidelity, amongst other things. Um, but since closure, since we weren't registering um, new families, um, I was really tasked with um, kind of helping to guide some of the online instruction. Um, so I haven't actually been in the classroom, but I'm in constant contact with um, our departments. Um, and so I did ask our colleagues or my colleagues to kind of report back and as I was going through their comments, I noticed there was kind of like three main topics, which would be social, emotional, instructional, and then logistical. And so some of what I'm going to say, I think we've already kind of touched on, but I, I do find it interesting that across the board, we're seeing similar situations. <clears throat> so as far as social, emotional needs go, um, our teachers really stress the importance of those Google Meets. And as a parent, I have seen my second grader try to attend a Google Meet and it is chaos at best. The best teacher in the world cannot really do an, an effective Google Meet with eight-year-olds. So I can only imagine what the five and the six-year-olds might look like. Um, so those Google Meets really have become more of like a social hangout. So a place where the kids can connect with each other and, and quite honestly, we need it. You know, we need to see them. They need to see us. Um, and we did notice too that throughout the, the closure, most of the kids who are participating were either L's or former L's. Um, so I think that really speaks to the need to connect. Um, we also thought that constant communication in any format, whether it's the Google Classroom, whether it is talking points, messenger, cell phone, whatever you're comfortable with is really key. Um, our district was really proactive in reaching out to families, providing um, food drop-off if, if needed, <clears throat> excuse me, all, all of those types of um, things needed for social emotional well-being. Um, my colleagues at AIC, which is Albany International Center, our newcomer program, really talked a lot about um, kind of keeping, um, keeping track somehow of the contact that you've made. So whether it's attendance, any notes, um, and then sharing that with your student support team because uh, the student support team can then provide that additional step and reach out to the families to provide um, you know, any of the supports that are needed. Um, one question that has come up consistently is what the impact is going to be on our students' mental health. And obviously none of us know that, but clearly it's something that's going to need to be addressed um, and not just for else, for all the kids going forward. So moving on to instructional <clears throat> talking points learning. Um, again, across the board, it was less is more. Keep your Google Classroom clean, um, keep it organized. Uh, one teacher recommended posting your, um, your assignments on a, on a weekly basis. So you have, here's what we're doing for the week, here's assignment for day one, day two, day three, day four, or however your schedule is. And then that way the students are getting constantly bombarded with numerous assignments they can work at their own pace um, and then it kind of also helps as far as keeping um, the classroom clean and organized um, another suggestion and i thought this was a great one this also comes from aic is to make videos using a document camera so if te teachers were able to collect any of their stuff from their classroom and use a document camera that's one way to do it but there's also apparently and i haven't tried this yet um, there's some ways to make a document camera using um, PVC pipes in your phone. And so um, the math teachers, the co-teachers um, at AIC have been making videos using this homemade document camera. Um, and they've had great success with it. The kids can rewind the videos, they can watch it as many times, they can stop it where they have questions. Um, they, they found it very, very useful. Um, and I do have the link that I can put in the chat um, for that homemade camera if you haven't been able to get to your own document camera. Um, one of the other comments too was to keep 
your templates clean and simple and, and use a large font because some of our kids are actually accessing the material on um, their phones. And so if you've got a teeny tiny slide that's crammed full of lots of information, it's even harder to see if they're using a smartphone. Um, we also found that online instruction has given us a lot of flexibility. Um, we have so many resources out there, but it's also important to keep it consistent because we don't, you know, if we're overwhelmed, you can only imagine how the kids are feeling. Um, and then I, uh, to piggyback on what um, Jennifer was saying, to embed that instructional technology from the get-go and, and maybe even embed that right into our curriculum so that kids know how to log on, um, they don't feel left behind. Um, but even things like, like you know, vocabulary, etiquette, um, pragmatics, all the things that are necessary to engage properly in a digital classroom. And then <clears throat> find, oh, and then also too, um, we also found that a lot of the kids who don't always speak up in class really kind of found their voice in this platform because they could use so many different ways to show their learning, um, be it Flipgrid or, or um, any of the other resources that are out there that we've used. And then logistically, um, we noticed that our database wasn't quite as clean as we thought it was. And so we needed to update some um, students' addresses, phone numbers. And so as, as much as we try to keep it consistent, there might be a time in the beginning or maybe mid-year where we need to check in with our families and just say like, hey, have you moved recently? Have you changed any of your information? Because in this type of situation, if we don't have that, we can't, we can't stay in touch. Um, and one of the teachers, actually, she's on the call, pointed out that, oh my gosh, if, if I was a parent, you know, as a parent, if my school couldn't reach me, if my child was, had an emergency, that's a problem. So um, really stressing that with our families that they need to keep us informed of, of that kind of information. Um, and then finally, logistically, um, we want to talk about streamlining, streamlining our district webpage. There's a lot of clicks necessary, and Google Translate's great, great for the families who can read in their first language. But if we're constantly having to click here and click here and click here just to get to food services, um, it's just too much. You know, again, going back to that less is more. Um, we want to acknowledge that the digital divide is real. And doing the, you know, we did our best. I think the district did a phenomenal job getting technology and hotspots out to families, but our families have, um, some of our families have large numbers of children and a family of seven, for instance, may not um, be able to share a single Chromebook and that needs to be addressed and acknowledged. And then we also talked about um, how our parents may not really be comfortable leaving a digital trail and um, that doesn't mean that they don't want the support from their teachers. There's a bazillion reasons why um, they may feel uncomfortable logging into computers, providing information for their child. Um, you know, obviously we think of immigration as one of the big areas. And so just to be kind of aware of that and to provide some alternate formats for the students. Um, but overall, the teachers um, felt it was, you know, as, as crazy as it was in the beginning, um, it really showed how resilient teachers and students are. Um, we've all engaged um, way beyond our comfort zone with technology and um, the different platforms that are out there. Um, and then finally, um, and I think we commented on this too, but having time to reflect um, and have conversations that are meaningful around individual students with our co-teachers. So we, we all kind of got to know our, our students a little bit better um, as a team of teachers versus just, oh, that's an ENL student, you know, you need to contact Jody. Um, everybody kind of got the chance to really see what a day in the life of a, of a student might be. I know that was a lot and it's a little noisy here, so I hope that <laughs> you can't hear all the trucks in my backyard, but um, that's all I got. Thanks, Jody. That's a lot. And really, I know, I'm sorry. It was too. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's all, it's, and it's all super important. Um, so thank you for that. Um, before we open it up to the group and we talk about what, what districts are doing for moving forward and next steps and what we know and, you know, what our areas of certainty are, um, Karen and I just wanted to take a, a minute or two and just share some of our lessons learned as 
um, teacher educators and um, from the, the higher ed perspective. Um, first of all, we, we just find that our, our partnerships with all of you in, in the districts are just so important. And we really appreciate the way that you have continued to um, support our students as they're in their preparation. I mean, just because school shut down doesn't mean that we, we can't, we have to keep finding ways to um, prepare teachers for today's classrooms and classrooms of tomorrow. Um, that said, you know, Karen and I have really taken a look at, at our curriculum for our program and we're really trying to make sure that we're embedding these instructional technologies and even just the, these ideas into our courses because we want to make sure that we are preparing our students to, to the best of our ability for whatever it is that they might um, be seeing in the classroom. So. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be reflective here and responsive um, to everything. And, and we, we do hope that um, we'll be able to continue these partnerships with all of you because um, our numbers continue to increase. And we have a lot of people out there who really want to be ENL teachers um, for, as, a, as an initial certification. And then again, um, as an additional certification. So we have the two groups. Um, Karen, any, any other things that I didn't cover that you'd like to bring in from the Clarkson perspective. You have to unmute, Karen. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One thing that we talked a lot about and have thought a lot about is how we can approach this situation um, with sort of a need, meeting a need. We took from the last time that we met, that initial meeting that we all had um, weeks ago, um, that there were sort of some immediate needs for some translation and some assistance with um, language assistance with families. We do have a lot of bilingual students in our program, uh, bicultural, bilingual. So we were really actively trying to match up some graduate student assets, you know, some, some strengths that our graduate students have around language um, and match them up with school districts who needed those language services. And the benefit to the graduate students is that they get some experience in the ENL world. But I think what we learned is that logistically that's a lot harder than <laughs> we thought that would just be like, oh, we'll put these two things together. But logistically, it was really pretty difficult because of privacy concerns and um, all the things that go along with, um, with you know, students who are under 18. So we've just had to try to really think creatively about how we can both serve our school partners and then also help our graduate students to get the practical experience that that they really need um, to be ENL teachers. So for um, so they're as Gretchen said, they're still out there. They're really eager to help. So if you are um, a teacher who's going to be working in um, who's going to be running a summer school, for example, we have graduate students who would love to be of assistance in any way they can. You know, there's and as Gretchen said, we are actively teaching instructional technology now. Um, we started a course um, to, uh, that is virtual teaching or online teaching for in K-12 schools, and that's for all of our graduate students. So it's really just made us think about new ways of doing things and how we can help our teachers to be ready for um, what's coming down the pike. And um, we, as Gretchen said, totally depend on our partnerships with all of you, so thank you for that. So I think um, we've got a little bit of, we've got some time. So um, Gretchen, did you want to open this up to um, to others in the in the group to share their experiences? Yeah, I think that that would be good if um, anybody has something that is maybe a new idea that we haven't um, addressed here. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And then if anybody has any questions or challenges. Um, or concerns that they want to bring to the group and get some advice or some ideas, um, we can do that as well. I love the Zoom etiquette. Nobody's like jumping right in. <laughs> We've really learned a lot with Zoom, haven't we? <laughs> Let's open it up or if you'd like to share anything about what you're, what you're seeing for next steps um, for moving forward, um, that too would be really great to hear.
Okay. Uh, is it Jenneth? Jenneth, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hi, how are you? You're Jennifer, right? Or I'm Laura? What's your name again? I'm sorry. Laura? Do you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm Jennifer. Did you want Laura? No, or? I was just asking her her name again. <laughs> Gretchen. Oh, my I'm, name is Gretchen. Yeah, Albert. sorry, Gretchen. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a very nice uh, meeting over here. My name is Jeanette. I'm from Ecuador originally. And I got in touch with this meeting because um, Peggy Ohana, she sent me an email. And I, I'm, I mean, you all professionals and you all like, you know, teachers, you know, you're, you're amazing. And I think you're doing a great job. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job. And I, I, I mean, it's amazing how many things you have to learn and you have to teach as well. I have a 12 year old son and um, he's doing the Google classroom. And I see that um, you guys have to put a lot of effort and they have to put a lot of effort to understand and to like, uh, you know, to get everything together, that way you can get things right, right? And it's it's very, very impressive. I really thank you, but I actually, I think um, this class is, is very, very advanced for me, but I can get a lot of information from you guys. So I'm staying here and, because I was taking that for the ESL course for a second language to teach that with Peggy Ohano and Port Washington Library. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that's why I'm here. And um, I just want to congratulate you that you, you do a great job. And um, yeah, the kids, they, the kids are so uh, smart these days that they know a lot. They know how to mute. They know how to, you know, like, they know everything. And um, but they, they le they're learning and they're really trying. My son actually enjoys online teaching, but the only thing he says, I. I miss my friends. Yeah. But he, yeah. yeah. But um, he does a good job, and he is um, very into it. The only thing sometimes I like to say, uh, kids are not participating. You, I see you guys have to ask three, four times questions, and they like, mm, they don't want to, you know, they they don't want to talk. And uh, that's one. My son sometimes don't want to talk. I say talk. You know, you interact too with your with your teacher. And I think that's very important for you too, because you know the kids are listening and they're learning. So, and um, I just, uh, I, thanks for having me on the meeting. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions here. Um, first, let me just direct everyone's attention to the chat. Jody posted the um, link for the document camera and Jen um, posted um, a link to their Padlet. Um, going back up a little bit though, Crystal wanted to know if anyone had suggestions for emerging L's during a remote learning, um, their parents are struggling and so are the students as well. So does anyone have any, um, suggestions, things that they've, they've learned, um, found success with when it comes to, um, emerging L's? I think that at the primary level with our emerging L, something that's been very successful and, and Mary touched upon this as well is meeting with my emerging students one-on-one -on -one and just spending some time together, often doing a read aloud, you know, having them do some, you know, guided reading, things like that, that they're ready for. Just really having that time with them to keep them speaking English because many of our families are speaking their native language at home, of course, which you know makes sense, but they're not having as much exposure to English. So just really having that daily time, it doesn't have to be a long time. You know, sometimes it goes longer. Sometimes, depending on what we're doing, especially if the family gets involved. And that's something that I put in the chat room. One of the greatest things, honestly, about pivoting and moving to remote learning for me is that my students are teaching their families English and their families are sitting off to the side of the computer because they're there to support their child to mute and unmute and, and everything else. 
but they're learning English. And my students are telling me that, you know, mom and dad are speaking more English at home because they're learning it, which is, which is definitely a bonus to, to the remote learning. But I really think just trying to have some of that face-to-face -face, well, even though it's over computer time with your emerging learners. Yeah, yeah Laura, I would- that, that is a great point, Laura, that we, you know, we think about um, what some of these affordances are and, and that certainly is um, one of the benefits, um, being able to have that, the, that closer connection maybe to the families and being able to extend the learning beyond just you know, the student, but with the family as well and, and bringing them together. So thank you for sharing that. Um, it looks like we have a best strategies and practices um, for emerging learners from Coleraine, Colorado. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I also just added to the, to the um, chat uh, a link to no tech, low tech, and high tech options that Arburn put out. So you might find that helpful because it, um, perhaps having some no tech options for entering or emerging L's might be beneficial. I think I said, what, Mary, were you chiming in on what Laura was saying? Yes, I, just, I wanted to um, just add on that um, I do have several students at the emerging and entering level and uh, like Laura said, I think including the families has really been one of the most important things to do. It does help um, with one of my families that uh, they speak Spanish and I'm able to communicate in their native language. But periodically through our school closures, we've included some um, either parent and family phone calls to just check in with the parents or we've set aside some time to do meets with them to see how the learning is going at home or what's working and what's not. And I feel like that, um, that parent voice has been really important for how we've tailored the instruction for, for all students, but especially students who may not be completely understanding the classroom instruction and then will need additional support from um, an ENL teacher or other teachers that are working with them. Thanks, Mary. Are there just, other questions? Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, can I just tag on to that? Please do. Um, <laughs> so I um, saw on uh, Larry Ferlazzo, Ferlazzo's website, um, he uses with his older high school L's, uh, I think it's called English Central. And he, it's like one of those independent activities that he asks his students to do. They spend about 15 minutes on it. Um, so that's just another choice that you could give them and it probably would be beneficial for the families as well. So I actually have a question for everybody. I'm um, curious about how you all are thinking about the, um, the units of study and the number of minutes, the amount of time that students are getting of English instruction at each, at the different proficiency levels and how um, if you have any thoughts about how that should be looked at in an online, in this kind of learning environment in case it continues into the fall. That's been a, um, a really big question for us at Gilderland, especially since um, NICE had released their guidance document a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've started to have department conversations about around those topics that were highlighted in that document. Um, but something our, our district and department has done specifically is as we're winding down, we've created um, a sort of reflection document for our whole team to respond to some questions, but also similarly to this webinar to think about um, what's been working, what tips and tools and tricks can share with each other. What are we uh, wondering still about the fall? Um, and so in regards to the minutes with our district, we have a district um, guideline with the number of hours per grade band that students should be engaging in learning, um, watching videos, completing assignments. It's all bundled under that suggestion. Um, so that is very different than what our existing uh, minutes are right now for students at different proficiency levels. So 
I think all teachers have been have been meeting those minutes in, in a variety of ways, but it's certainly something that um, if we were to calculate specifically, we would certainly see shortages um, of students not maybe getting their entire minute because it's what the district has suggested guideline. Um, and also just having multiple meets across the day. A student is, you know, attending different group sessions across different uh, classes. Mary, yeah, I'm, go ahead, sorry. No, I'm, I'm finding the same thing that Mary's saying, especially with our younger students, because I have, I have many students that are at the emerging and entering proficiency level, as Mary said that she did as well. And so when we're thinking about 360 minutes, a week um, and another big consideration is that my district initially and it still stands true for now I'm not sure if it will be modified over the summer or into the fall but my district you know has not had the expectation at the kindergarten through second grade level that we would be even having Google Meets or having Google Classroom that was not how it was rolled out within my district it that was definitely an expectation for third grade through 12th grade but I was, I was doing them and I was exploring having meets because I wanted to continue having my students, you know, practice their English. But I think that, you know, a real challenge is that, you know, to have an integrated setting that would be, you know, just thinking about the minutes, if we're talking minutes, you know, it would be a half an hour meet with my co-teacher for integrated and then a half an hour meet individually for standalone for many of my students. So that's an hour right there, not thinking about, any of the additional learning that we're asking them to do. And it didn't fit well within the guidelines either that Arburn had set out, sent out. It definitely was um, just challenging to think about how we could do that without having deficits. Yeah, I think Karen brought up a great point here in the chat that a uh, one on one meeting with a student is a different use of time than with groups. Um, you know, not all time is created equally. And so when a student is sitting in a classroom um, with, you know, several other students, they're not getting that one to one that, that you're giving them with that Google Meet. So um, hopefully state ed will look at, at that differently as well. Mm -hmm. Um, would anybody else like to um, add thoughts or bring up another question or concern? Well, in, in my experience with the online instruction, I have found it most beneficial to utilize those co-teaching relationships as a way to support their English language development because when you're looking at the guidelines, especially the ones perhaps sent out by Arburn, where it recommends no more than two and a half hours a week of, instru of online instruction for students in grades K through two, you cannot hold an hour long meet every day with your entering and emerging else. It's not feasible and it's not developmentally appropriate to have children of that age spending that much time sitting in front of a screen so fostering those relationships with your co-teachers so that the lessons that they are also providing are properly scaffolded, I feel is, the, is perhaps our best method of ensuring the English language development of our L's. That's a great point. Karen, you were gonna say something, weren't you? And I, was, I was just gonna say the same, that thank you. I think that's a really important point in considering co-teaching and all of this. Um, is is definitely I'm I'm glad people have brought it up because it's really an important piece of the of the puzzle. So it seems like Gretchen, I don't know. It seems like we're wrapping up here. Um, are there any? And does anybody have anything that like moving forward, thinking about the fall, thinking about um, the summer, what the summer is going to look like, how we're going to keep our students. Um, moving along. Um, anybody have any final thoughts they want to share with the group? Uh, I did see a question in the chat from Marla. Um, 
there is a federal law, but uh, guidance from state ed relaxed the regulations due to COVID-19. Thanks for responding to that. Um, so I'm going to just put up here um, the link for um, getting CTLE credits for New York State TESOL. Again, this was a webinar hosted by New York State TESOL. Um, if you're not yet a member, you can still join for 2020 um, for the 2020 year. Um, if you would like to get CTLE credit, um, I'm gonna give the instructions here. And I'm trying to type and speak, so I'm gonna stop <laughs> speaking so I can type. <laughs> okay, and I'm just gonna, um, Laura Abate, Good to see you here, but <laughs> um, you just typed in something in the chat. I'm wondering if you want to elaborate a little bit about how you're co-teaching in your Google Meets with three different grade levels. Sure, so um, I teach third, fourth, and fifth grade at Schuyler Elementary, and sorry, is it loud for you? There's like someone mowing their lawn. <laughs> no, we can't hear it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, and I, initially I was hoping to, to have my own Google Meets. I have my own Google Classroom, and I, I actually video record the ELA stories that they're required to read and respond to in their classroom Google Meets and post those on my page. But my, um, my live interaction with my students is mostly just within the context of their classroom because I feel like that's just the most efficient thing to do. And, and it actually allowed me to co-teach in a way that I wasn't, you know, in, um, in the school as much. So I feel like, you know, cause I go to all the common planning times with those teachers now, I can. And, um, and I pop into their Google Meets and I help them scaffold the lessons and we, we talk about the students more. So I feel like this has almost forced us to, to go further down that road of, of co-teaching quicker <laughs> in That's a way. That's great. Um, yeah. but I, I do, you know, some one-on-one -on -one, um, lessons still with students, but um, it's mostly in their classroom. Very good, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I think it seems to me that we're gonna wrap this up here. Um, Gretchen, is there anything else you wanted to add or? I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day and you know I know your schedules are still crazy and we're all just like combat crawling to the finish line here um, but it's really very nice for us to be able to come together as a community and um, we you know we need to do this more um, we need to, to be supportive we need to be able to advocate for our profession and, and for our students and their families so thank you for taking time out of your day to be a part of this. Yes, thank you all. It's all. It's always so good to see a, a group of people in the same area um, coming together to help each other out. So I think that's what this is all about. So thank you, and we hope this was helpful. Gretchen and I always learn from these kinds of things, and we love hearing from what's happening in the classrooms every day. The online classrooms, that is. <laughs> so we, we wish everybody a, a wonderful summer. Um, stay healthy, stay safe. Take some time for yourselves, recharge your batteries, um, and we hope to reconnect with everybody in September when we're back in face-to-face -face classrooms. Um, we can still do Zoom, but maybe it'll be less Zoom <laughs> and less hanging out. Um, so until then, have a great summer, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Be well.